Next week is Pentecost Sunday. And so this is officially, unofficially, the beginning of a new series where we're going to look at things related to the Holy Spirit, living in the power of that Spirit. And we don't yet have a name for it. I'm sure Trevor will be back on um, next Sunday to preach, and I'm sure we'll have a title by then. Um, but uh, community leaders, there will be notes available um, for, for you, for your communities. We're going to be looking at issues of breakthrough and what that means for us. So, and excuse me if I splutter, I have a little bit of a cold, I might need to deal with that, but my heart is full, um, so don't let the spluttering interrupt God's agenda. When last did you move a mountain? <laughs> Not the response I was anticipating, but absolutely. M mountains can be quite tough to move. And Jesus had mountains to move. I want to take time today to look at two events in the life of Jesus that are very un-Jesus-like events. He curses a fig tree so that it withers and dies, and then he goes to the temple and he clears the temple of its traders. It's very different behavior to the Jesus we see who calls the little children onto his lap. Or who speaks to the Samaritan woman with dignity and care. It's light years away from the Christmas carol, carol that says, the little Lord Jesus, no, no crying he makes. Yet these events are filled with every bit as much meaning and intent as any other event in Jesus' history. It helps for us to think about what Jesus' mindset was like in these moments. This was Monday. The day before, Sunday, the people had been lining the streets of Jerusalem with palm leaves, singing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And after all those high moments, later that day, Jesus goes to the temple, but because it's late, he and his disciples do nothing more than a reconnaissance visit, and then they spend the night back in Bethany. And I'm sure that overnight, those scenes of the temple played in Jesus' mind. Thinking about what his response would be to them the following day. I'm sure that's not all that was playing on his mind. If we think that the first time Jesus experienced anguish over his coming crucifixion was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sweated blood, I think we're doing a disservice to his humanity and thereby probably to ourselves as well. The impending trauma of the crucifixion and the joy of establishing this new kingdom of God grew within him as he grew. The events of Mark chapter 8 where Jesus feeds 4,000 and then heals a blind man, took place a year and a half before these events that we're looking at today. And at that time, it was the first moment that Jesus informs his disciples that he's going to die. 
He tells them again at the end of that year. That would have been in about August AD 31. And then later that year, in Mark 9, he tells them again. And in Mark 10, verse 32, he tells them a third time that he will die and rise again. And that happens probably around March AD 32, just over a year before these events would take place. And now he's in Jerusalem. The clock is ticking. And every wakeful thought, Jesus is preparing to move a mountain. I want us to read from Mark chapter 11 and beginning at verse 12. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him saying it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is willard. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believing that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Those last two verses in particular remind me of the Lord's Prayer. If you ask anything, you'll receive it. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Go straight into forgiveness. My first point this morning is that Jesus feels figs for fruitless effort. I wonder if that's where the saying comes from. I don't know. The walk from Bethany to the temple wasn't a particularly long journey, about just over three kilometers. But Jesus was hungry, and he sees a fig tree and leaf, so he goes over it, and once he gets close enough, he realizes that there are no figs on it. It was early spring. Late enough for the tree to be in leaf, but too early for figs. And Jesus curses the fig tree. It's a real wow moment because it's so counterculture to anything that we've seen Jesus do in the past, unless, of course, if he's speaking to a demon. But I don't think this is Jesus getting mad at a fig tree. I think there's a transference going on here. 
that Jesus is upset about something else. Otherwise, he may as well have cursed every other fig tree in Israel. And besides, if Jesus really wanted figs, do we really think that the one who was able to feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish couldn't have somehow made that fig tree all of a sudden produce. So what's going on here? Jesus' primary interest is not hunger, but his mission. And in that moment, I believe Jesus sees a picture of exactly what he had been called to come and do. I'm sure he would have been aware of the scripture in Micah chapter 7 and verse 1, where the prophet Micah laments the diseased condition of the worship in Israel. And he likens it to a barren tree. What misery is mine, Micah says. I am like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the early figs that I crave. Just like the fig tree, the temple worship of Israel is also looking fruitful. There's a lot going on, a lot happening, a vast sacrificial industry. In fact, I read somewhere in the preparation that on the Passover weekend, something like 18,000 sheep were slaughtered in two hours that would go on um, in that Passover time. And there were a lot of religious hierarchy. But it become as spiritually empty of fruit as the fig tree. The old covenant was coming to an end. And so in a prophetic declaration, Jesus says, May no one ever eat from you again. Bearing in mind that in a week's time to the day, Monday the following week, Jesus would rise from the dead and inaugurate the new covenant in his blood. Not only that, but instead of having to go to the temple in Jerusalem to encounter God, the Spirit would be given to live within living temples so that Jesus himself could live within us by his Spirit. What grace. What goodness. I think it calls us to ask the question, is there anything that we hold on to in our lives that maybe at one time was life-giving, but it no longer has life? You're just going through the motions now. What do you need to stop that no longer carries the life of the Spirit, and of Jesus Christ to you. Secondly, Jesus forever clears a way for true worship. Jesus moves away from the fig tree and goes to the temple, and he interrupts business as usual. And it's not the first time he's done this. It's not mentioned of in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in John chapter 2, just after the wedding where Jesus turned the water into wine, Jesus did this for the first time. He goes to Jerusalem, and also at the Passover, he says the same thing and clears the temple. Get these things out of here, he says. 
How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Now, right at the end of his earthly ministry, it's Passover time again, and he clears the temple once more. Not with a whip this time, but with just as much zeal and purpose. What were the money changers and the tables and the, the, the animals doing there in the first place? Well, the law gave instruction, and we're not going to read it, but for those of you who are interested, you can go to Exodus chapter 30, verses 13 to 16, that shows that any man who entered into the temple, had to pay almost like a cover charge of half a Jewish shekel. It was used for the upkeep of the temple. But because they were now under Roman rule, Roman coinage was the common currency of the day. So money changers provided the convenience of exchanging Roman coin for the Jewish half shekel. For a small fee, obviously. The Roman coin wasn't accepted in the Jewish temple because it carried the image of Caesar and so was considered idolatry. So the practice was legitimate. But add human nature to the mix and you've got a recipe for all kinds of fraud and extortion and the abuse of the poor. When we were recently in Lebanon, we had to change our American dollars into Lebanese pound. And Pastor Magdi was clear to us to say that there were some places that you could go to to change your money but there were other places that you really didn't want to go to because you would be shocked. <coughs> Changing money at the temple, though, was a little like buying a Coke at the International Departure Lounge. You know what it's like? There's nowhere else to go. You can't go back out. Back out. So you've just got to accept having to put up with daylight robbery. <laughs> Jesus wasn't putting up with this. Because for Jesus, this, this wasn't just an abuse of power. This was an abuse of worship. Jesus, speaking from Isaiah 56 and verse 7, says, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And notice that this time he says, my house. In the John passage at the beginning of his ministry, it was my father's house. And then he adds from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, but you have made it a den of robbers. This area that Jesus cleared was the outer court of the temple. It was supposed to be the place where travelers from around the world or those who lived in the city in Jerusalem but were not Jewish but were God-fearing could come to the temple and worship and bring sacrifice and receive forgiveness from God. That's why it was also called the Gentile court. Because it was for anyone, women and men from all nations could be here. But the Jewish establishment decided that this place would be better served as a livestock market that would inevitably distract 
and rob people from the priority of worship. People like you and I. This is good news. Because Jesus is clearing a way to true worship. He's restoring the temple to its original purpose. But at the same time, Jesus is also ending the temple regime that had gotten itself stuck in ethnic pride and greed so that a better temple could rise up that would never exclude the other nations. And Jesus himself is that renewed temple. He is where forgiveness will be found for all people from now on. And his forgiveness comes without a cover charge. No half shekel needed. So when Jesus overturns the tables in the temple, what he's essentially saying by implication is that he's offering himself as the alternative sacrifice. I see here an incredible memory of our future. If we turn to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 10, after this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne. And in front of the land, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Isn't that interesting? Palm branches, just like the day before this event. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I see that picture of Jesus creating a place where we forever can find God and worship and we'll do it with Him in heaven again. So can I ask, what's distracting you from worship? Are there things in your life that really just limit Jesus having full access by the power of his Holy Spirit to your life as he intended it? Thirdly, Jesus' faith moves mountains. It's now Tuesday. Jesus and his disciples again left the city overnight, probably went to Bethany, probably stayed with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, as he'd done countless times before. And now on Tuesday morning, they go back to Jerusalem. And because they're on the same path, they walked it yesterday, now they're on it again. So they come to where the fig tree was, and Peter draws attention to the fact that it's completely withered. And for Jesus, the fig tree was no longer about figs. I know that. Because his answer to Peter, he doesn't mention figs, he mentions mountains. What mountain? The mountain 
of dead, corrupt temple worship that he had come to fulfill. Let me read it again in Mark eleven twenty two. Have faith in God, I tell you. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Jesus has the mountain of moving what has been established all the way since the patriarchs to a new and living way in him. But not only is Jesus moving mountains, he gives the disciples the ministry of moving mountains. Remember I asked that at the beginning? Have you moved any mountains lately? He's still in the mountain moving business. On a good day at the beachfront, it can be stunningly beautiful here in this city. Absolutely amazing. But Debbie has often said to me that she's always felt we lack a mountain. You know, Cape Town, when you're there, you can, climb, you can go to the top of Table Mountain or to Lion's Head, and it gives you absolutely beautiful vistas of the, um, of, of the coastline below. We have Brooks Hill. <laughs> and surely Debbie and I are not the first ones to think, oh, wouldn't it be nice? to have a mountain right here on the beachfront. But obviously no one's ever prayed for Table Mountain to move to Klabeha. <laughs> because clearly Jesus wasn't talking about the fact that we have the ministry of cursing fig trees and moving physical mountains. For Jesus, the mountain he was referring to, as I say, is the Jewish religious system. And he's not in it alone. He invites his disciples to take ownership themselves. And we know through Acts how they do that in their ministry. First in Jerusalem, and then Paul as he goes out into the known world at that stage. But we do so through faith and by our prayers. Jesus had come to cleanse the temple of its dead religion. And Jesus expects his disciples to share in that responsibility. Through prayer, Jesus gives us the invitation to take down mountains that are dead. And I believe that invitation is extended to us even today. We can see deadness all around us. It's not just in religion. It's all over the place. We are life givers. Jesus says, the way you battle it is through prayer. And if we ask God in faith and through the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us to tear down dead religion and the dead stuff that we see around us, He hears us. We don't have to ask if it's in His will. It is in His will. And when we ask God to build in its place a global church that establishes the kingdom of God among us. We know that he hears us. 
And we know that He will answer us. Because Jesus Himself is the author and perfecter of the faith that moves mountains. We all may have mountains in our lives. Some big, some small, but they're mountains. They shouldn't be there. And they remain obstacles to what Jesus wants to build in us and around us. What mountains are you trusting Jesus to move in your life? We need to come to him and pray, believing. Worship him, won't you come and join me? What do you need to stop? Because there's no more life left in it. It's just motions. What's distracting you from worshipping God fully. What do you need to clear away? Because there's tables in the temple that shouldn't be there. We're never more secure than when we're communing with Jesus. As he meets us, in this temple the temple of the Holy Spirit and as we commune with him Jesus who is the temple I know it's a little bit difficult to understand because we're a temple he's a temple we're going to go to heaven and there'll be a temple there just accept it all allow Jesus Commune here. Yeah. We're going to sing to give our hearts away, to give our lives to Him. Not for the first time, maybe for the first time, but we're working out that salvation with fear and trembling. Something we do daily. And we want to clear those distractions. We want to stop those things that have no life, that are taking up time unnecessarily. And we want to move the mountains to establish the kingdom of God in us and around us. Let's stand. And let's see. You'll know that if God moves upon you, and you want to declare that by making a tangible expression of that, you're welcome to come to the front. And someone from the ministry team will come and pray with you. You're wanting to declare it right where you are. That's also fine. You have that freedom. The key is that we become the mountain movers that God intended us to be. And we allow His kingdom to reign uninterrupted within us and through us. 